Hello and welcome to a true multi-topic lab update. So, uh, as you've seen in the last video, I've delivered um, the Audi A2 to my friend now. And I'm almost suffering a PCD, post-conversion depression. Like, your main project's done, what do you do next? So, um, there are things to do next. So, we will be talking today about the new 16 channel BMS, how that's coming along. Um, and then I will give you a brief look in a book that we've written that um, goes into great detail of an EV conversion of a Volvo. And then we will also talk about this guy here. Let's get right into that one. So, what we see here is called the Tibba Pulse, and I've become a customer of Tibba. And Tibba is an electricity provider that um, charges the spot market price, plus some fees. So, if you uh, use electricity while uh, it's plentiful, uh, you pay less than when you use electricity when it's not plentiful. Or you could say, if you use electricity when there's a lot of renewable energy on the grid, you pay less than when there's a lot of fossil energy on the grid. Because fossil is expensive, renewable is not. Yeah, so I've become their customer and they provide you with this little gadget here. And as you can see, it's still in the box. And the purpose of the gadget is to uh, send uh, your, yeah, your current uh, power draw from the grid so that they can actually assign your, your energy consumption to the hour when you needed it. To, yeah, to charge you the price at that very hour. Now, as it turns out, uh, this little gadget is um, a bit unreliable. So it took quite a while um, until it actually supported my meter. And when it did, um, it turned out if you just sneezed a bit too loud, it would lose connection to the infrared port of the meter. And um, yeah, to cut it short, my own solution for reading the infrared port is just way more reliable. And I found out, um, with the help of many others, how this thing communicates with Tibba. And so now I'm using my own reader device to, yeah, to forward the data to Tibba without using their pulse gadget. Another advantage is that um, the pulse reader needs batteries and my solution does not. I will link in the source code down below that makes it possible. It's not super refined, but it gives you the idea. Now, let's take a quick look into the book. So the story with this is um, Dr. Udo Kessler. He, owned a, he owns a Volvo and he wanted to convert that to electric because yeah he's very worried about climate change and he wants to do something within his own power to yeah, cause less emissions. Now the good thing about Udo Kessler is that um, he is not technically inclined like he's not an engineer or mechanical engineer or anything so that gave him the unique perspective of all the things that we um, that uh, we engineers take for granted. So he is actually the ideal man to write a book on EV conversions. And he documented uh, in great detail all the changes he's done to his Volvo um, to convert it. Seven questions if an uh, EV conversion is for you. So you might buy this book and find out, well, it's actually too complicated or too expensive or whatever. So here we go, all the... <coughs> pretty pictures, some storytelling, and finally, here, this is something I've never done. So he has taken um, precise notes of all the stuff he's removed uh, from the car. So the original engine was 180 kilograms and stuff like that, and then all the little stuff, the big stuff and the little stuff for the EV conversion, like cooler with holder or adapter plate for the gearbox. All that's being accounted for and turns out the car is just 78 kilograms heavier uh, with a quite decent battery size. 
Right, so this book has been out for a while. You can buy it as a physical book in both English and German and also as an ebook. It's all available in the Open Inverter shop. It should become available on Amazon, but of course they will be charging more fees and also they don't seem to be able to deliver just yet. Right, let's swing over to the BMS. Yes, here we go. I know it's been featured many times. Um, and yeah, it's now become stable. Uh, quick history lesson, the yeah, some version before that, that I was doing in Sweden worked perfectly on 16 channels, no issue whatsoever. But then when we put it into a clipper cab taxi with a Nissan Leaf pack, it turned out as soon as you connected more than one um, module to the system, uh, the transistors would burn out for no obvious reasons. We never actually found out why. So I've changed the topology around uh, quite a bit. I've removed all the battery side logic and replace it by primary side logic that gets uh, sent over to the battery side wire photocouplers. And yes, I will actually show you later on how this works on a battery pack. So right here I've got my little test bed on the, on the table here. I might just power it on for you. Mm, you will get might hear some transformer hum. Um, yes, so you see the whole conglomerate. Uh, you can see the power lines, the gray and the red, running from module to module. You can see the CAN bus, uh, the twisted one, running from module to module, and finally into my little CAN gadget here. And then you see the gray wire that runs from module to module in a daisy chain manner. Yeah, so the idea here is, or the, the working concept is, that the first module has uh, 12 volts on this uh, enable wire. And by detecting 12 volts, it knows it is the first module and it becomes the master or main module, so to speak. And it does all the high level communication with the VCU or the, the rest of the car. And then the other ones uh, become, well, what's the new word, sub submodules? So, not slaves, God, no. Um, and they know that because they will only be seeing 3.3 volt on the enable line. And the enable line actually <coughs> physically cuts the enable pin to the DC-DC converter. Um, so when it's off, the thing is off, it consumes no uh, current whatsoever. It can, however, choose to stay on even if the enable line is off. And that's by having the processor well, enabling the enable line by itself. And this can be useful for long-term balancing or capacity estimation, stuff like that. Yeah, the software is not quite finished. It's just far enough to read the voltages and it can calculate some crude power limits. And um, yeah, that's about it. And I'm working on the software as we speak. All right, let's turn it on and if you Pay attention to the uh, to the LEDs here. You will see they come on in sequence. Yeah. So what you saw was the first module comes on immediately. The second one is enabled by the first, and the third one is enabled by the second. As we can see, um, there's some auxiliary inputs as well. So each module can read two temperature sensors on these pins here, and one current sensor. Of course, current sensor only makes sense on one module. It doesn't make sense to read the current multiple times. And so far, the current sensor has to be on the primary module, but that's just a software thing. Goody. So that's uh, not too exciting yet. Uh, let's go down to the shed and connect it to an actual battery pack. All right. So here we've got the thing in action. Um, yeah, 16 cells either side. This is the primary module, this is the secondary one. And um, yeah, well, it just measures the voltages, I guess. Mm, yeah, got a small power supply here. And then here on the laptop, uh, the communication isn't super comfortable yet. We have to use a command line tool. And it gives us, uh, I will 
I will screen capture that for you. This gives us um, yeah, the individual cell voltages and we can see one cell is pretty broken. Cell number six sits at 1.8 volts. Oops. Um, and then communication from the other module is uh, just limited to some accumulated values because we don't care about the individual cell voltages on a high level, but more about their minimum, maximum and average. And that's what we receive on some special yeah, values here. And we see the other module seems quite okay. The minimum voltage is 3.29 and the maximum is 3.32. We've also got parameters to uh, to, parameter, to parameterize a SOC curve, so um, like how many volts is which state of charge, so that we can do an estimation. And we've got more plans with that. Yeah, but most importantly, the system now works uh, with uh, two modules cascaded. I haven't tested with three, but even two were problematic. Um, back in London with Clipper Cap, and obviously that now works. All right, I think that's it for today. So I will link in the, the book down in the description. I will link in the sources to the Tibber source code down below as well. And um, yeah, I think that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time. Bye.